Hi, good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. It is a great honor of mine to have been able to put together this symposium with the people at the Newberry Library and the McNichol Center and with the um, CNAIR at Northwestern University, as well as my colleagues at the Field Museum of Natural History. Um, first, I'm Miranda Roberts. I am Northern Paiute and also Chicana. Um, I'm currently at the Field Museum as a postdoctoral researcher, but also as a co-curator. And what brought us all here today and what was bringing us as a whole into this conference was me and Kelly Weiskup, who's also a, um, a co-organizer at Northwestern, were thinking about how the founder or the person who collected items at the um, Field Museum and then put them into the collection once it was established, how did he assemble all of these items, specifically Native American items? Why was, what was his purpose? Who was his target audience? Who was he as a person? And what kind of relationship did he have with these native groups who he collected from? And to me at that time, when I was thinking about this was because that's how we are gonna be able to know more about who, how these items have been displayed over time. Um, um, sorry, I lost my train of thought. Um, so basically what ends up happening is that we decided to just create a conference that could help understand in which, how have some of these collections been made? How have they been assembled over time? But most importantly, what has been in my focus and my area has been understanding how have indigenous people intervened in these spaces since these museums collections and their foundings. So how have people, indigenous people been able to speak to the ways in which we are remembered in these spaces, how we are talked about. And even if it's in an archival sense, are they leaving notes behind that people can find later? Are they contributing certain items and artifacts um, that their descendants will be able to recall at a later time? Or are they purposely trying to fool the collector at some points? So this is why and how all of this came about. And I hope that you'll be able to experience this with us and be able to learn a lot from all of our amazing panelists today about how they as indigenous people or as allies to indigenous people have been able to intervene in these spaces to create our own, our own dialogue about each other and our communities and actually fix some of the harmful stereotypes and narratives colonial spaces have made. So um, there's some quick um, little logistical things. We, um, there's a Q and A that you will be able to respond to and ask questions in, in the webinar format. We are not gonna be able to answer questions via Facebook or YouTube. However, um, we're hoping that you all will be able to have some questions of yours answered. And if anything, you can always reach out to our organizations to find, out, to find us and to find out more. Um, if you are able, if you're in the webinar right now, you should be able to get in with the same link that you were provided with when you registered at the Eventbrite. And if you're, um, and if anyone has any problems, you're always gonna be able to watch it via Facebook, the Newberry Library's Facebook and YouTube. And I think that is, please also know that we are doing um, a hashtag for this. So if you are on Twitter, Facebook or Instagram. Our hashtag is Indigenous Interventions. Please feel free to use that as much as possible. And if you find any technical difficulties, again, just go ahead and place them in the Q&A and one of us will get back to you. So without further ado, I'm going to hand this off to my colleague and a friend, Heather Miller, who is at the American Indian Center, so she can provide us with a land acknowledgement. Hi everyone, it is an honor to be here with you all today. As Miranda said, my name is Heather Miller. I am an enrolled member of the Wyandotte Nation from Oklahoma and the executive director of the American Indian Center. Um, so the last few weeks, I think we can all agree that it's been 
a really roller coaster of emotions. And so um, I definitely want to wish everybody a happy uh, Friday the 13th today. <laughs> Just take a moment to be silly. Um, we are all here today on the topic of archives and museums and specifically how Native people are choosing or not choosing to interact with such institutions. Our current climate is showing just how painfully obvious change is needed and wanted. On, on their surface, museums and archives seem resistant to change in the ways um, in the, their design to tell the story of one history or one perspective. Native peoples have been left out of these spaces. So when we're brought in with new ideas and innovations, um, that's, that's one way to bring that change and healing to the table. So as we begin this conference, I also just wanna take a few minutes to incorporate a change in our thinking by centering ourselves with the land acknowledgement. I ask that you place your feet on the ground and just think about your place for a minute. I acknowledge and um, give respect to the land here in Chicago that my feet are on today. I am thankful to be in a place that has major waterways that created trading routes and urban lifestyles. Most importantly, I want to give honor and gratitude to the first peoples of this area who have lived in relationship, cared for, and welcomed others to this area. I recognize the Potawatomi as the signers of the Treaty of Chicago. But I also understand that uh, other tribes like the Odawa and the Ojibwe, members of the Council of the Three Fires, also called this place home. I also recognize that other tribes, including the Miami, the Ho-Chunk, the Menominee, Illinois Confederacy, Peoria people, and even Kickapoo, have maintained relationships with this area. Despite all these government policies that have enforced genocide of American Indians, Chicago today is home to the sixth largest urban Indian population and consists of members from well over a hundred different tribal nations. We continue to live, to love, to work, play on and share these lands as our families and relations taught us to. We're also going to continue to make changes in all of these wonderful museum and archive spaces. So I hope you all enjoy hearing from um, these panelists today. And it is my pleasure to turn this over to Stormy Weber. Thank you. Okay. Hello. Hello. Can everyone hear me? Yes, we can hear Good you. Good morning. Okay. Fantastic. Thank you so much, uh, Miranda and Heather for that beautiful introduction. And, and I thank you so much uh, for the uh, invitation to share a poem with you this morning. Um, I'm very honored and I'm very much looking forward to uh, learning from um, this, this, uh, this webinar today uh, as I watch it online. Um, uh, my name is Stormy Weber. I, I live in Seattle on Duwamish land near the Salish Sea. And um, it's very early here. And I'm 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 happy to to join. Um, my uh, my background is I'm I'm black native. I am um, uh, Sugpiak, black and Choctaw, and urban native. Uh, and I, I, the sh the poem I'd like to share with you is is particularly um, a special poem to me because it it was inspired by my grandmother who was born in Seldovia, Alaska, and um, brought to Seattle as a girl. And she found in uh, in jazz music um, a spiritual foundation for her survival, and it gave her a great deal of strength. And she shared that that blessing with me. So I wrote this poem, and its title is Grace. I thank you. <clears throat> Grace, Grace, ease on over me, because I live in music, and you can find me there in the discordance and confusion of everyday life. I'm there in between a blue note and a new note. I'm there. Grace, ease on over me. See me and fall all over my everything, for there is nothing you cannot stand or understand. I trust myself in your hand. I can rest easy because I know you love me. You always loved me. Through the bitterest seasons when rhyme left me stranded, you walked with me full of feeling and spoke in total silence. 
I swear Aretha Franklin has saved my life more times than I can count. And if Billy sent me sometime to the 57th floor, why well, she'd always find a way to sing me down. I could glide down easy on Charlie Parker with strings and find myself in April in Paris. Chestnuts in blossom. And somehow at those moments, nothing else mattered. At those moments, nothing that is not music can touch me. Spirit swathes me like impervious armor, and I understand what keeps me living. You see, it's the sheer goddamn funky swing of it all, the mystery at the heart of it and at the end of the road. I understand now why Nana played that record, Songs to Torch By. Now, Torching is not a widely known about thing anymore, but those folks knew they knew how to get a misery out of you before it became fatal. Why just roll yourself in it and let the tears and rage flow out. Let Billy carry that cross for you. She already died for your sins, don't you know? So when I get the lowdown miseries, I reach for the tried and true soldiers of survival, and they come singing and moaning and falling out and getting back up and exhibiting so much class and grace and style until after some time, I feel my soul stretching and straightening up, filling my living frame, and I once again rejoin the human race. Music is my mistress, and she and I will never part. I thank you. Wow. Thank you so much, Stormy. And thank you, Heather, for starting us off in such a good way. I'm Alaka Wali, and it is my pleasure to start our symposium with the first panel within non-native cultural institutions and we have four speakers as you see on the screen I'm just going to briefly introduce all of them now and then they'll speak in the order that I've introduced them um, so first off we have Dr. Samantha Major who's an assistant professor of Native American literature in the English department at Marquette University. Her current book project focuses on indigenous philosophies of materiality emerging from the portrayal human and non-human relationships in works of fiction and poetry by native writers. Our second speaker will be Miranda, Roberts, as you heard from her earlier. She is an enrolled member of the Yarrington Paiute tribe and Mexican American. She earned her PhD at the University of California, Riverside in, Na in Native American studies. Miranda is my colleague at the Field Museum as postdoctoral fellow for the Native American Hall renovation. She's working on curating stories that could be told in the new hall as well as provide feedback on how the museum can work more seamlessly with indigenous people. Our third speaker is Nina Sanders, senior fellow at the University of Chicago, Neubauer Collegium, and she is a curator, writer, and cultural consultant. Uh, Nina has done work for the School for Advanced Research in Santa Fe, the Smithsonian's National Museum of the American Indian and the Field Museum, where she curated the groundbreaking ex exhibition of Salige Women and Warriors. Nina has written for the Smithsonian, the First American Art Magazine and Native American Art Magazine. And she recently published Salige Women and Warriors, a scholarly publication associated with the exhibition at the Field Museum. And finally, we'll have Dr. Eli Suzokovich, who is Little Shell Band of Chippewa Cree, and also Krajina Sir. And he is an anthropologist with a focus on cultural resource management, ethnography, 
religion, oral history, and ethnobiology. Currently, Eli is also my colleague at the Field Museum. He's a research scientist in the anthropology department, and he's also a lecturer in the Environment Policy and Cultural Program at Northwestern University. So it's my pleasure to welcome this panel and to get us started with Samantha. Thank you. Good morning. Hello, my relatives. Uh, it's wonderful to be here with you. I'm so honored to be on this panel. And I want to say uh, thank you to our hosts, the Newberry Library, Northwestern University, and the Field Museum. Um, and I can get started with the, the next slide there. Uh, my research and teaching centers on Native American literature with particular attention to the ways that Native writers and artists challenge and disrupt, reread, and indeed intervene uh, in the archives that represent the collective memory of the United States and other settler colonial spaces. So, you know, contemporary Native writers often introduce readers, especially in, in my classes with my students, to the complexity of, uh, of the archival and museum space by centering indigenous objects and histories within their stories. Uh, Native writers and art artists often uh, offer a vision of these objects and histories that stand in contrast to the ways that settler colonial institutions construct narratives around the archival materials. And so they offer a critical intervention in the way we collectively tell this history and represent native people as well as our relationships and our understanding of non-human objects. Um, and so today, you know, in just a brief amount of time, I am hoping to offer two examples of these literary indigenous interventions and connect them to a couple of items found, um, one at the Field Museum and then another from the Newberry Library. And just talk about these are um, pieces uh, that I reference and bring into the classroom when I teach these particular texts and also when I write about them. So I'm gonna start with um, a couple of works by uh, Dakota writer, Susan Power. And I'm particularly talking about her novel, uh, it's there on the screen, but The Grass Dancer, um, and then her nonfiction collection of essays uh, called Roof Walker. There's a particular essay in that collection uh, called Museum Indians, uh, where she talks about going to the Field Museum with her mom. Okay, Susan Power is a Chicago uh, native, grew up in Chicago. Um, and so she references the Field Museum in both of these texts. Um, within the storyline of The Grass Dancer, Power features the description of a particular blue beaded dress that within the story is on display at the Field Museum. And the first mention of this dress really comes in a chapter called Moonwalk, where we have uh, set in 1969 on the eve of the moon landing. Uh, and we have a character named Margaret Many Wounds who is on her deathbed and talking to her grandson, Harvey. And she tells him about this blue beaded dress at the Field Museum that was her grandmother's dress. And she says, quote, someday when you're grown up, you should liberate my grandmother's dress. She also tells him more about the dress and its purpose. She says, quote, the background was blue beads and my grandmother beaded buffaloes and Dakota warriors on horseback running through the sky, pictures of their spirits because so many of them were dead. She wore it to only the most sacred ceremonies. And when she danced at the edge of the dancer's circle, she said she was dancing them back to life. So when I read, you know, uh, The Grass Dancer, 
um, I was immediately drawn to this blue beaded dress in the storyline and the dress come, goes throughout the novel and actually, um, you know, becomes this central object that helps uh, connect kinship over time and space. Uh, and Moonwalker is a, is a particularly extraordinary chapter for showing the power of this particular dress um, and, and its introduction to the novel. Um, and then in, in the nonfiction essay by Susan Power, uh, she describes going to the Field Museum as a child and her mother bringing her to a blue beaded dress that was on display there and saying, you know, uh, this was made by a relative of ours. Um, and, and they went regularly, uh, as, as far as my understanding goes, to visit this dress in um, what was the Plains Indian Hall for so many years at the Field Museum, okay? So when I had the opportunity to visit the Field Museum myself, um, this is a couple of years ago, back in 2016, uh, this Plains Indian Hall was still um, intact and had been unchanged for many years. And um, really at that point, you know, 2016, it seemed very, um, not just outdated, but uh, one could tell it was missing so much information and context about the objects that were on display. If we go to the next slide. So I went there looking to see if there was a Dakota or Lakota blue beaded dress on display. And indeed there was. Um, there were actually three of these dresses uh, and this was sort of a style of Dakota and Lakota dress uh, with the blue field of beads and then designs uh, within that blue field. Um, very much a tradition of a 19th century, uh, late 19th century, early 20th century beadwork. And um, this is the first of them that I saw on display and one that continues to uh, draw my attention. And I was interested to see it, uh, you know, as you see it here, uh, displayed in a, in a case with uh, other clothing displays from various tribes. And the extent of the information given about this object was just that little line down by the feet there, Sioux woman, okay? And, um, you know, to be honest, it was, uh, yeah, I am of Dakota background. It, it was upsetting to see the dress with so little context, uh, you know, displayed on this faceless mannequin. And I thought how interesting that the, the dress, you know, the, the story that the museum is telling about the dress is here really so shallow. And it takes our indigenous writers um, like Susan Power, the, the context that she gives this dress in her work um, for students to sort of understand that these objects that you might come through a museum and encounter have such life and performative power. She describes the performative power of this dress that you put on and dance. Um, with and um, and so you know that's my first example. Just briefly, I want to go to my second example. If we go, I think two slides up. I want to talk a little bit about Miko Kings as well. This is a novel by Leanne Howe, uh, published in two thousand and seven. And I often teach this novel, which is a, an Indian baseball story. And Leanne Howe, I think, is known in her work for drawing on archive for doing heavily researched work. Um, and she begins her novel opening up with, um, first of all, a map of Indian territory. This is a, a novel that's set in Oklahoma uh, territory at the, the, the moment of statehood. She gives us a book and then um, a still frame from a film. And in the novel, she has a character who's trying to understand her own heritage and, and finds a journal from one of her relatives. And how gives us this whole journal 
um, within like 60 page chapter within the novel of these letters that a relative wrote from boarding school. And I have my students read this chapter of these boarding school letters and the character as old day ends each of those boarding school letters with the, the Choctaw phrase, see Appella, help me. When I teach this, I often bring in um, a piece from the Newberry Library, if we go to the next slide. This is a, an autograph book from Charles Caleb Amera, who was a student at Chamawa Boarding School in Oregon uh, in the late 19th century. And an autograph book is just like a yearbook, except for it doesn't have the, the photographs of everybody. And so page after page, uh, you have signatures uh, from students. Um, and so I have students look at this and connect with uh, sort of this archive information on boarding school um, letters that with uh, Leanne Howe's novel, you get this broader context of how this fits into history. So again, in the archive, we might just look at this piece um, and not understand the full context, but there's a connection to baseball here, and maybe we can talk about it in the um, in the in the question and answers. But I just wanted to share two examples of the way our indigenous literary artists have intervened and speak back to these archives. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Hi again. Thank you again for joining us and for listening earlier. So, um, and thank you for all of the amazing people who came before me right now. Um, I always, so my pre presentation is going to focus on how I approach the museum in terms of understanding the ancestral items that are there and how they and their life force are something that are, is drawn to their descendants today. And I ground that discussion in my own personal understanding of who I am as an indigenous woman and as a Mexican American woman and how I can help the museum understand the ways in which those connections are deeply rooted in who we are as a people. And so I always kind of begin my, my presentations with showing a picture of my homelands in Nevada um, and the water and the desert that sustains me, as well as a photo of my great great grandfather who is in his um, personal um, regalia, well, not regalia, but his ceremonial items. And I found this particular photo at the Field Museum one day. And I was actually having a really hard day when I came across it. And so it was like he was waiting for me. And this photo of me, of baby me, is with my um, Mexican American grandfather who was brought over to the United States at a very young age and was taught from a very young age that he should be ashamed to be Mexican. And he was beaten a lot for speaking his language, for speaking Spanish. And he always wanted to impart to me personally that you don't ever let anyone take your culture from you. Um, never stop being educated and go into these places and show them who we are. And so these two men found me in my approach to how I take care of the land that you see right here, but also in the ways in which I approach museum work. So. Oh, next, I'm sorry. <laughs> so um, one of my big things has been looking at how have indigenous people intervened? And I like to think about how those items that sit in the collection, and I'm using the Field Museum as an example right now because that's where I am and currently working, is how did these collection items get here? How, what was their purpose? And again, I'm situating this in the terms of the Field Museum and the collection that Edward Ayer, who is this man in the middle that you see right here. And who was he? And did he even understand the type of items that he was bringing into the collection? So earlier there was a question about um, the World's Fair and the influence that it had on the assemblage at the Field Museum. And yes, that's the case. And a lot of those items were um, collected by Edward Ayer who then was the one who convinced Marshall Field to donate the money that was needed to actually create the physical building that is now the Field Museum and was the one who donated a majority of that collection. So
So of Native American items, particularly of Plains and Western tribes to the field or to the field museum where it was there that you have, but he, well, I always go back to why was he doing that? And if you look at his records, it's because he is uh, saying a lot of the time that no native people will ever be around ever again after a certain time. And we have to make sure we collect everything we need to in order to um, be able to talk about them later. So this idea of the vanishing Indian and the idea that we wouldn't be around any longer. And so that's very much grounded in the founding of this institution that I work at as an indigenous person. And I try to think that of course there is a lot of interruptions in people being willing to sell their items because they need to, or maybe they weren't sacred or you know, they were made specifically for a trade market. But also there's also those items that people had to part with or were stolen from them. And so I look at how, when we take that narrative of the vanishing Indian, and then when we take that narrative of what was given and what was taken from our communities and what those items represent to who we are as a people, how does that all live in one space together? And in my personal opinion um, is that when those items that I refer to as ancestors are living in a place like the Field Museum, they are waiting for the most part for us as descendants to come and be reunited with them. And there are lessons that are there in them that are continuous. Um, so, and I firmly believe that those lessons and those ideas um, are deeply rooted in us as a people and are also deeply rooted in those particular items. So a part of my Instagram stuff is always thinking about how do I help people understand this? And this is something that I wrote, um, as you can see, is that they collected these men, usually um, predominantly white men collected because they thought we would vanish, which is why they could never have dreamed, um, next, that the people who they stole from or took from would have descendants that would lead the charge on reclaiming what is ours and our ancestors and our dreams. And these men certainly never believed their museum would be a site where indigenous people from across the globe would gather, meet, pray, and cherish one another. And here are some examples of that intervention of people, Native American people, particularly Frank Walm, who was a later panelist, as well as Nina Sanders, Kevin Redstar, and Ben Pease, and Elder um, Grant Bulltail, Absalaga Elder B Grant Bulltail, reconnecting with items that their communities have not had a physical interaction with in generations. And when that happens, there is a type of happiness as well as profound introspection that happens with people about how, what can they learn from these items and what ha lessons have been taught or left behind for us to be able to take back to our communities. So like with Grant looking at this shield as an elder and this man who held all of this amount of knowledge about Upsalaga people and spiritual life ways, being able to hold a shield from his community that was having to be sold for them to live is being able to bring about all of those stories that he was raised on and to be able to reconnect the dots on. This is what my elders were talking about and this is what our people should be learning about. So. And even though the shields weren't collected by Edward Eyre, that understanding of what kind of item should be collected is what was imparted because of Eyre's collection. And again, you have these sites that are very much, we have Frank Wong looking at different items that he's never seen before as well and learning from these artists. So when you look at these pieces, sometimes these artists are, are astonished to learn that maybe they have been painting an item in a certain way, and it wasn't always the correct way. Um, and that's okay. And learning from those things and being able to um, fulfill that dream and that understanding. So, and then also being able to understand that like we were very blessed to be able to have Grant Bulltail provide us with a prayer where, and pray in these spaces to help ground us. So, um, Again, okay, so next slide. And also, so going off of that narrative, this beauty does not excuse the harm these spaces have caused. 
and continue to cause our communities. Rather, the power of these connections helps us to unlock the lessons encapsulated within our ancestors who are housed at a museum. And our convening in these spaces provides us with continued support and love that we need to keep surviving, educating, and creating. And every time we meet, laugh, connect, cry, eat, and learn from one another in and around these spaces, we prove just how much settlers underestimated us and our love for our people. But more importantly, they underestimate the love that our ancestors left behind for us because all of the things in a museum collection, for the most part, I don't want to say everything, are done um, with a specific intention and with a specific thing in mind. And therefore, um, when you do that and when you implement that and you take that with you, you are and you're a descendant from that community or you are someone who appreciates the world of views of that community, that type of interaction and that type of love gets into you and you're able to take that back and do work for your community and be humble enough to know that sometimes you're gonna get it wrong, but that you are still being able to do your work in the best way possible. Um, and so here you have, when that happens, when you're able to bring about these connections and these love is when you see here, um, Nina Sanders, who is with her, her grandmother, who is now on the side of the Field Museum out of love, out of her dream of being able to produce this exhibition since she was a child and then have her people and, her, and these artists being on the Field Museum site where it was always believed people like her and her family would not be seen. And there's beauty in that. And I can give you more context about that flower that is blooming, but that is from the dirt Grant Bulltail prayed with when we were together. And from that experience, something bloomed. So these items are alive and with us. And so when you look at how people like Edward Ayer or other um, particular groups of people have um, collected our pieces, they never understood that love or that appreciation that we have and that those, our intervention is in the items themselves because they're waiting for us. Um, and they wanna go home or they want us to be able to sing their praises. So I'm gonna end there and I will go ahead and get Nina Sanders um, situated. Thank you. Hey, show Ravalaja Nina who be a Baleo should be the Gavalaja. Um, it chicken it in a wild valley of Rodina, the one name Marchish Cole Wuglaga. My name is Nina Sanders. I'm whistling water. My crow name is Brings the Water. It's a lot of water. Um, I'm thankful to be here with all of you. I'm thankful to Miranda. She, we're actually sitting in the same COVID spree, free space right now. Uh, I'm thankful to Miranda for putting this together and all of the incredibly brilliant people that will be presenting all day long. Um, I think we're all gonna be homebound, just glued to our monitors today. Um, so I think we have like 10, 15 minutes. There's always a lot to say. Um, I thought a lot about what interventions means. And um, I can only speak from my own personal experiences and those of others who've given me permission to share. Um, and so I think that's kind of what I'm gonna do, but real quick, um, I always sort of just feel like an imposter, like uh, I don't know if I should be sitting here because I've been a lifelong educator and a mother. Um, I have been living on the reservation most of my life. I have four children. Um, six, if you count adopted and, and ceremonial children. And so I have lived on the reservation most of my life. I lived on the Psalaga reservation until I was a teenager, moved to Phoenix, uh, lived on the Fort McDowell Yavapai reservation for close to 20 years, um, have lived in Palaka and Hopi, Arizona, and also in the Northern Pueblos in Powake in Santa Fe. Um, I've been working in museums for about five or six years now. Before that, I was an art teacher. I worked with K through 12 um, in early childhood development, looking at children's um, learning abilities, uh, how people can be better parents from the time that they conceive to the time that a child is five, because that's where neural development happens. All of this segued into working in education and realizing, and then going to school on a state university and realizing that there really isn't anything uh, curriculum wise that 
teaches children, native children, anything about themselves. It's, we're not even talking about the rest of the world or the country, specifically just native children. And I found that problematic. So what I started to do is develop curriculum around art, uh, language, singing, things that would specifically work towards uh, developing the prefrontal cortex in young children. And so in this work, I started to go into museum collections because, you know, little do most of us know that we're able to go into a museum collection with an appointment and pretty much look at most of your people's things, unless there is a guideline or a stipulation by a tribe that says that you cannot, which most tribes I think are pretty flexible. It's the sacred material that we tend to kind of keep away from and we'll get to that later. So in this, um, you know, I think one of the things that I'm speaking to in interventions, and it goes back to what Miranda was talking about, and also um, <clears throat> this idea that there are these objects in museums that bring us back. They don't forget us, they remember us. And um, looking at science and thinking about epigenetics and how DNA is transformed um, and how certain things can activate our DNA right, um, like trauma, the best example is trauma, um, thinking about when a person's trauma is activated, how that person reacts, the way that their body responds to that, physiological, emotional, all of this. And when a person, when a native person enters a collection space, when they touch their ancestor, um, because this, when we make something, and as an artist myself, when I bead, when I cut my fingers, when I bleed onto something, when I cry, when I pray, right? All of us have these experiences as we create, as artists. Um, there's a part of me that lives in the things that I make. And I'm pretty sure the people who own those things can feel that presence. That's how powerful we are as human beings. We give things life. And the things around us give us life. And so taking that into a museum space and then having a relationship with those objects, with those collections, until that life force is activated. And sometimes those things can be activated for better or for worse. But one of the things that's another intervention, so that's one intervention. Another intervention is in thinking about who we bring into those spaces with us and why and for what purpose. What are we doing with this? Is there a vision? Is there a plan? And if there's anything that I imagine about our ancestors is that they were always thinking ahead. They were already thinking about us before we were even a twinkle in anybody's eye. Um, I think that they anticipated us. And so in that, we think about our descendants. What will they be dealing with? What will they see in these collections? Are we gonna give everything back? Do those tribes even have collections places? Having lived on the reservation most of my life on multiple different reservations, nobody has a collection space. There is a couple places that have cultural centers and museums, but they are not fortified to be taking back war shields, war shirts, powerful medicine. So in this, one of the only things we can do is fully integrate ourselves into museum spaces and invite other native people in. And if we're not doing that work as Native people or non-Native people, if we're not helping people reclaim space in these collections, in these museums, telling their narratives, writing it down for them, cultivating writers, doing this work where we're really actually trying to manifest something that is a collect brand new collective experience that puts Native people at the forefront our histories, the way that we think, our creation styles, the things that we believe in, our songs, the things that we choose to share as a community, we have to lift each other up. This is the work that we are charged to do. And, you know, um, to be completely honest, I'll say that I think my biggest challenge in museums is not, it hasn't been, you know, non-natives. It hasn't been white people. It's actually been other natives. And so I'm going through something where I just feel hopeless on some days. 
and I go to the river, I go to the lake, or I go to the mountains, and I cry because, man, natives are really abusive towards each other, and that has to stop, and we have to hold each other accountable for being that way. We cannot be saying ugly things about one another on social media. <clears throat> we can't be writing terrible things, trying to tear one another down. If we don't understand what the native, other native is doing, we need to ask or we need to just say, you know what, they're really smart. That person's a good writer. They have many good friends. I trust that they know what they're doing and I'm just gonna stay away from it and be quiet. I think that that's an intervention. I think that we need to learn how to respect one another. We need to learn how to listen. We need to learn how to think about this person's way of doing things works for them. It works for their people. It works for their tribe. So should I stay out of that? Can I go get to know them and kind of learn about what they do? Do they have space for me in that? These are the conversations that we need to be having because there's space for all of us. One really big colonial idea is that there isn't enough for everybody. So we should hoard, we should keep people out. We should be real careful about like who we bring in. And that's like not an indigenous way of doing things. Indigenous people make space. If you have somebody new come along, whether it's like a brand new tribe and they look like they might not be doing well, settlers, right? Let's feed them. Let's give them the tools to help them survive. Um, and this is what our people did, even if they didn't trust. And it's about trust building. We build that trust through communication, through breaking bread, through getting on the phone, through crying with one another, through really thinking about like, how do we activate and animate these objects? Or how do we learn to respect them and put them in a place where they can be kept safe and left alone? because that's what we have to do. And the only way you know how to do that is by having conversations with communities. I wouldn't be in the position that I'm in if it wasn't for some white person down the road that opened the door for one of my ancestors. I wouldn't be in the place that I'm in right now if Pueblo people didn't do the work that they've done. The things that Pueblo people have done in politics, in museums, in education is incredible. The same goes for Lakotas, the same goes for Navajos. And you know, I think we've become so colonized that we disassociate ourselves from our people and then we dismantle the work that they do and that has to stop because nothing good is gonna come from the work that we do as individuals or small groups if we don't learn how to either communicate with one another or respect one another. That's my intervention. Um, I think for non-Native people, I think that non-Native people have to sort of imagine that science can include the sacred. And then imagine that being professional can also contain building relationships in more intimate ways. Really listening, picking up a phone call and calling someone. Rather than sending that email, that curt email, um, sending a text message, you know, sending something that is meaningful, that's like, wow, this person is really trying to engage. I think Native people know when that sort of um, authenticity is happening. And most importantly, I think in respect to all of my brothers and sisters who are on this call, who are on this webinar, um, in thinking about, let's get to know what the other person is doing. Let's think about that work that they're invested in and ask, how can I help you? Is there anything I can do? How can I stay out of your way, right? So I know for myself, if there's an opportunity to bring someone in and replace myself with them, I do that work. I do it all the time. And I know when to step back. And I think that when all of us find those boundaries, when we find those spaces, we'll all do better work. Um, I think it's now our time to learn how to motivate and manifest and really work with one another and doing good work and transforming entire cities and nations and the world eventually because native people are strong, we're blessed, we're incredible, we're creative, we're powerful and this work is easy. It, should be, it shouldn't be so difficult. I think if everybody works together, it'll be a lot easier. Oh, we should.
we are just messing this up. Excuse me. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sorry, one minute, y'all. <laughs> Next, we have Eli Suzuki. Okay. Are we all ready? Yeah. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Eli Zizakovich, and I'm a Little Shell Band Chippewa Cree out of the great state of Montana, but born and raised in Chicago. Uh, so today I'm going to be talking a little bit about unintentional interventions and interventions that happen by accident. And in particular, I'm working with the uh, Meskwaki tribe of Iowa on uh, exhibit featuring seeds and materials from the William Jones collections. Uh, so I will, why I say accidental, if we uh, go to the next slide, um, when first I'll introduce you to William Jones, who he was. So right up here is sort of the basic facts that a lot of people know about him. But one thing that is important about Jones is that um, he, his grandmother actually played a massive role in his life. His grandmother, his mother died when he was about a year old, uh, but his grandmother raised him and she was kind of the mother, father, grandmother, grandfather to him. Um, she was a high level member in the Midday Lodge and was a healer. She was an herbalist and from about, you know, birth to about age 12, uh, Jones was by her side. He spoke Meskwaki as his first language. Uh, but he also learned a lot of botanical knowledge from his grandmother. And when he went to Harvard, he actually wanted to be a medical doctor with the sole purpose of working in Oklahoma or in Tama and basically being a doctor for Native people. His, his career path kind of changed, though, when he was in Maine, he encountered some Pesmaquadis, and as they were speaking Pesmaquadi, he could understand them, and he saw the relationship between Meskwaki and Pesmaquadi and other Algonquin languages. So he became interested in linguistics uh, and linguistic anthropology, and what his goal is in a, in a time of salvage anthropology where most anthropologists, and really they weren't even anthropologists, they were just people who worked for the war department um, were collecting dying things, dying culture, dying languages. For Jones, he saw that there was a need to preserve these languages because he was watching language loss. And so he kind of ded dedicated himself to language preservation, but also seeing how all Algonquian speaking people were related linguistically and matching up those stories. So, as a grad student, getting his PhD, he was a student of uh, Franz Boas, and Boas, Put, uh, Putnam, and George Dorsey were working on creating the Field Museum. And one place that they wanted to go was Tama, the Tama settlements in Iowa. Meskwakis pretty much have been always been conservative in their culture. They didn't share much, and there wasn't a lot known, and outsiders really had a hard time. So if we go to the next slide, um, the Tama expedition. So what Dorsey, Boaz, and Putnam were interested in was salvaging authentic Indians that Meskwakis were seen as these holdouts of an ancient time and you know they're expecting primitive life and everything like that. That's what they were looking for. And they wanted to do an exhibit in the new field museum that was being created at the time. And this is at the uh, Science and Industry Jackson Park location. Um, that's what they wanted. So they needed an insider. So William Jones, of course, being Meskwaki, um, being a fluent speaker, but his speaking level was at about a 12-year-old, which is about the time when he was taken from his grandmother by his father and moved out east. But he knew enough to get by. So the purpose of Jones really was not that they were bringing in native anthropologists or scholars, but they needed an insider and Jones was their guy. For Jones, on the other hand, he saw this as a chance to one, reconnect to one, to get out of the East coast. He had a, this, he hated the East coast. He did not, care much for East Coast liberals and education and a lot of the boarding school and 
sort of saving the Indian through education, as it were. He's not a big fan of that. Um, so being west of the Mississippi would made him happy. But also it was a chance for him to reconnect with Meskwaki people, work on his language work, and also to look at uh, ethnobotany. So after this three-year period, what Dorsey wanted was pretty things of a dying culture. Instead, and unintentionally, Jones presented contemporary life of the Meskwaki in Tema. Uh, many of the objects that were brought in were actually commissioned items. There wasn't a lot of items that were personal items. A lot of them were commissioned. And there's countless uh, letters between Jones and Dorsey where Jones is asking Dorsey to send money. If you don't send the money, you don't get any objects. Um, and that hasn't changed. It's 115 years later and we still always ask, we need money. Uh, nothing is free. But in particular, what Dorsey, Boaz and Putnam thought, they did, what they didn't realize is what Jones collected was about 242 botanical specimens that all have significance for Meskwaki medicine and ceremony. And the items he collected were also these objects that were made from these plants. So the collection had a lot of cattail and bulrush mats, a lot of uh, agricultural equipment, um, cottonwood bark, twine bags. And those were significant because by about 1900, uh, cottonwood bark was no longer being harvested in a lot of other communities, whether Ojibwe, Potawatomi, uh, Pazimakwadi. It was just sort of something that was uh, fading in lieu of like yarn and other sort of uh, industrial sisal and other materials that were readily available. So he collected those. And in particular, he collected, a, he commissioned a lot of half half finished items and we didn't know really going in two years ago going into this project didn't know why he did that two years in we're kind of figuring out why he did it and it was to ensure that if there were map makers and any Meskwaki who wanted to relearn these uh, traditions that there was something to teach with so a lot of his collection is also a teaching collection uh, so he collects this, the exhibit goes up and if we go to the next slide, uh, one of the remnants of that original is the summer house. And this diorama was created by Jesse Burt who also accompanied Jones out to Tema. And the thing about Jesse Burt is that his, his diorama was an ag architecturally scale model. Uh, everything in these models are to scale and they have all the authentic materials. If you notice the miniature cattail mats, those are actual cattails and they're woven in the way that a cattail mat would be woven. So this diorama is actually going to be sent to the Meskwaki Museum in Tama, Iowa. And Jonathan Buffalo is one of our collaborators and uh, elders, uh, fantastic gentleman. Um, was very interested in these. And he asked, you know, he said, can we repatriate the diorama? And the dioramas at the museum are not even, owned. they're not assessed by the museum. So they're really just sort of random art pieces. Um, so we'll be sending this back and this model is actually gonna be used to teach um, Meskwaki folks today, both young and old, how to build these larger, some, what they call summer lodges. Uh, this is a lodge style that hasn't been built in about a hundred years and there's an interest in reviving this tradition. So this kind of speaks to what Jones was doing is he didn't really care what Dorsey wanted. What he was interested in is how do you preserve Meskwaki culture and language? Um, and if we go to the next slide. So we jump to 2018. So remember the Tama expedition was a three year project. The renovation of the Native North America Hall is also a three year project. Uh, and it ha happened, and this Meskwaki exhibit happened by accident in some ways or just by chance. So Elizabeth Hoover, uh, 
was interested in the Field Museum's Oscar Wills collection. Oscar Wills collected seeds from various native communities across the country. She was interested in those collections. Uh, Shelly Buffalo, uh, who is our collaborator in Tama, works with the Food Sovereignty Program. She's a friend of Liz. Uh, and Luke Capayu, the gentleman you see here with the trucker cap, he had been going to the Smithsonian to find, uh, oh, we're out of time, to find the seeds. So long story short, after 115 years, the Meskwaki community is um, reconnecting with the objects that Jones brought to the museum. But I think in this time, we're not focused on the objects, but it's actually the seeds that you see before you. These are the ancestors that are telling the story for the community. And our exhibit is going to be based off of these seeds and everything that these seeds uh, touch and influence. All right, get on the skull, Martin. Well, thank you everyone. That was an amazing set of presentations. And um, we have plenty of time now for question and answer and um, um, perhaps even uh, more uh, comments um, for about your individual presentations. I wanna give you all an opportunity because 10 minutes was a pretty short time um, to talk about your um, work, which is so fascinating. And I really wanna thank you all for starting us off with such dynamic presentations. Um, and they really work well together too, I think, um, to hear the cross flow across all of the panelists. So, um, and I would love it if you all wanted to talk to each other as well. So if you have a question for one of your fellow panelists, um, please feel free to go ahead and do that. Also, we can have a conversation. Um, we have quite a bit of time. So here's a question for Samantha to start us off. Um, is there somewhere that folks can go to see a full picture of the dress from your presentation? The photos that I shared and just a couple are from my own trip um, to the museum in 2016. And I mean, I don't, think, I don't think any of them are on display anymore at this moment. So, um, you know, uh, folks might have access to, to my email and I'd love to chat more, but I, you know, when I went, there were, I was looking particularly for Dakota or Lakota dresses with that blue beaded background style, which is very common. I mean, I, any museum I go to that I look for Dakota, um, dresses, usually you find that, that style of a dress and, and it's not only Dakota, you know, who had the sort of blue field background as well. So, um, there were about three on display and a couple in storage as well. The, I think the Field Museum has at least five. And, but what's interesting, this is the first of the dresses that I particularly saw and I personally felt a connection with. Um, I briefly talked to Susan Power about uh, the dresses and, and sort of we looked at pictures together, but that particular dress has a very interesting accession card. Um, that's also revealing about how the Field Museum, how these institutions see these types of objects. And the, uh, the accession card talks about the dress being made by the wife of Chief Red Cloud. And, you know, talks about his military history, talks about how the dress went to his son and then how it uh, went through, uh, you know, uh, different traders hands and then came into, you know, the field museum. Well, of course, you know, uh, this leaves out the fact that uh, Pretty Owl, uh, his wife has a name, uh, has a whole history of her own that could be, you know, again, if we're thinking about how the stories we tell about these objects and the lives that they've lived and touched. Um, there's so much more to the story that I think our native artists show us. 
um, that um, hopefully, you know, in working with native people, our institutions are finally sort of getting that representation in full. Thank you. And I just want to say that um, we have not put all of our photographs of our Native American collection in the Field Museum's um, open portal, web um, portal for the anthropology collections, because we want to do better consultation with the, the tribes before we actually post that. But we did photograph all of the um, items that came off display. So we do have um, you know, fairly good, good quality photographs of those dresses. And um, if you write to me or Miranda or Eli, we can try and get you, whoever asked the question, we can get you a photograph of that dress if it's permitted. Thank you, Samantha. All right, we have a question for Miranda. Um, was there a recording made of tribal members who came to the Field Museum to view the items you discussed? And, or if not um, appropriate to record those interactions, were the names of the people who came recorded for perpetuity? And Miranda, someone else asked you a question also about, do you know how your grandfather's or great-grandfather's photo came to reside at the Field Museum? So you have two questions. Yeah, thank you. Um, so for the first one, was there a recording made? Um, I'm thinking you're, the person asking is referring to the people I showed in my photographs. So the, from Upsalaga Nation. Um, there's, there's a recording that they, that however many people came with our congregation, um, however, when you are doing this work, it's important when you have tribal members in a collection space that you as a non-native collection person or anthropologist or educator, let them tell you what they want recorded versus what they don't want you to have recorded. And when we brought in, for example, Grant Bulltail, one of the things we did was situate Grant will be able to tell another person from his community um, that he wants him to have this specific information. And then from there, the field museum will be able to get um, information that is relevant to the collection that they have, but not necessarily things that are of a sacred um, nature. It was dependent on what was appropriate. Um, there is also records of how native people came to the um, field museum um, as interventionists during the World's Fair. Now that's harder to pin down about like individuals, but there were people there like Simon Pokagan, who is um, of the Potawatomi, um, Pokagan Band of Potawatomi and having the um, Birch Park books explaining why having a fair like that is harmful. Um, and so there's a lot of that there. Um, and like I said, you always have to go and ask um, your community, you should never do any of this work without the community members having a voice and what they would like recorded versus what they wouldn't. And then you should always get permission if you're allowed to have any sort of audio or video or note taking capabilities. Um, and as far as my grandfather, so this person who went to go photograph, it also has collections from, um, so there's also a collection of photographs at the Huntington Library in California. So. It seems as if though this person, I forget who it is at the moment, but her um, Grace, it's not Grace Hudson, it might be, um, was going around California taking photographs of different communities throughout and you know putting them into an archive. And I just so happened to have found him in that way. And he's identified by his um, Bob Roberts, but he's identified as Yurok, which makes per perfect sense because our communities are right next to each other and different, and we always were going back and forth. So um, they live in two different places, but it just so happened I came across it at the Field Museum. Okay. Um, okay, now we have a question for Nina. She's coming back. Um, Nina, can you share with us about your work with the Chicago Blackhawks Native American Initiative? Yes. Um, so 
I started with them in September. Uh, Mr. Rocky Wirtz is stepped back to allow his son, Danny Wirtz, to take over. I believe there may have been a, a press release about that. And so in this process, Mr. Danny Wirtz is reorganizing a lot of things. And um, most importantly, in looking at the logo, um, really learning about who that man is, Black Hawk, um, and all the work that surrounds that, most importantly, um, helping the family, the team, the people, everyone who's involved in that with re um, introducing, actually, they haven't really had that much of a relationship with them, but actually creating a full relationship between the Sac and Fox Nation in Oklahoma with uh, the people of the Blackhawks. And in that work, that means that this family will go to Oklahoma and they will spend time with families there, obviously, when COVID is pretty much done with. And they will have a conversation about what is wanted, needed, expected. And then working with Sack and, Fa Sack and Fox artists and culture keepers, historians, archivists, um, bringing them back into Chicago and reacquainting them with their ancestral homelands. So um, maybe creating exhibitions in uh, the different spaces in Chicago, the different institutions, museums, uh, archives. Um, if any of you now are listening, uh, and we already have some relationships that we're building with these different places to bring the Sack and Fox in um, to actually create exhibitions, narratives from the community, um, actual uh, attire, outfits, things that can essentially teach the people in the city about who Black Hawk was. Um, and then there's a lot of other work that has to do with like food sovereignty, working with chefs, um, really trying to think about how to um, make this city healthier and thinking about uh, rematriation of seeds, working with community gardens, things like that, and then helping people understand their relationship with the land. So the work itself goes pretty deep in anything that I do. I really think deeply about how we can use our uh, networks and our resources in the best way to really help all Native people. Um, and right now in particular, uh, the, the most important sort of thing that's happening with the Blackhawks is that they are working with the Sac and Fox Nation. As a matter of fact, I just spoke to some of their tribal council, I think it was Monday. Um, and so that work we're moving forward, I think it's one of the most important parts of this conversation and consideration of this man is the ancestor of these people who were removed from this place and he fought dearly to be here. And I don't think it's an accident that in this incredibly ironic way, he's still here and it's going to bring his people back here. And so part of my work is just helping them understand like, no, you don't say that. This is what's appropriate. You need to be thoughtful about these things, thinking about give back, about just relationship building in general with native people, native nations, the people who come from those communities, um, advisors, culture keepers, medicine people, things like that. Um, so yeah, that's what I'm doing with the Blackhawks. Thank you for asking. Uh -huh. Hey, thank you. And we have a question for Eli. Um, could you tell us a little more about how you will create a display for the seed collection? So what we're working on is, so the, what we have in the gallery right now is looking at the growing season. So looking at the, the beans, the corn, squash, and all the you know, representatives of the seeds in the collection what their life cycle is and how the community tends to them. And something that's important to note, and I think Jonathan Buffalo brought this up, was that you know this, these plants, these seeds have been with the Meskwaki for about 3000 years. They've had corn for that long. And part of their responsibility is to constantly plant that corn and to tell its stories. And as long as they do that, they'll always eat. And it's something that irregardless of being other migrations or being forcibly moved or anything that has happened in their past, they've always brought their seeds with them and stored them and kept them uh, for future generations, but also innovated them. Uh, a lot of these uh, varieties come from the uh, Gulf of St. Lawrence where the Meskwaki originally come from. Uh, 
And as they've traveled, they have, you know, essentially engineered their seeds to fit all these different environments. And so we're centering on those seeds, but also what people do to preserve those seeds. So there will be a section on cooking and food preservation, um, where these, where plants affect design, um, in some ways where they affect uh, eating implements. So there's a lot of, uh, and even those wild foods like cattails and other things will also be in there too. And in the tradition of Jones, we will be having a partially finished uh, cattail mat by Mary Young Bear to complement a large cattail partition mat uh, in there. And the idea is to, show, to for Meskwaki today, when they see this exhibit, that they will be inspired for the, if they had questions of how do they make this. The other thing in is that the exhibit will be also in Meskwaki. Uh, that was something that they definitely wanted from the beginning was that the labels are in Meskwaki for Meskwaki speakers and for people to be inspired to learn uh, as well. So it's uh, the exhibit's coming along and it's just sort of this, as you're developing things, you know, we're two years in, I think we have a plan of what we're gonna be doing, but you know, within a year things change because it's just the process. But we will be revolve. The, the exhibit will revolve around the 2019 and 2020 growing seasons, um, and so there will be footage, and there will be, and the people telling the story are from the Tama settlement. So you know, our job as curators and developers is just simply we're just facilitating, and you will be hearing directly from the growers and community members. That's yeah, it's going to be great. One more year and people can come and see the whole new hall. Okay, here's a question for all of you. Um, so maybe answer in the turn that you spoke. Um, so many of you brought out the importance of humility and listening in trying to change these structures in museums and archives. How can we get dominant structures, um, people in museums, and universities to slow down and listen? Well, <laughs> um, personally, what I have found is having to be able to approach this museum work, especially if you're coming in as a person who is indigenous or of color and getting to know your collaborators as well as your coworkers and your directors and your board members, like really having conversations with them just about who they are, how they got to the place that they're at. Because then in, when you do that, you're able to understand their approaches to leadership. You're able to understand their approaches to um, who they are as a, a person and why they are inclined. And once those conversations start to happen, you're not just thinking of the museum as a structure, you're able to see the personal and the imperatives that go behind this work, because even if you're not native, this work is very personal. People are very much invested in a telling the science of something or talking about their communities or going and going on archeological digs or going to places in different parts of the world to better understand how we can work together to create a better world. And I think that unless I don't know that about you, I don't know how to best help you when the time comes, but also I would hope that in return, you would be able to help me. Um, and I think that when we ask of structures to slow down and to be good to each other, it means having to um, also recognize within yourself, like what are you asking, being very, being very specific about what do you want them to do? And that means having to have allies, having to have people who are thinking along the same route that you are, as well as being humble enough to know when to step back and to listen, I think is another big part of this work. And it's okay to be wrong. It's okay to not know. However, what isn't okay, and it goes back to what Nina was saying, is to bring people to the point where you are no longer able to have a conversation with each other. You're just openly expressing 
frustration, but not coming back with any solutions. So if we're going to actually do this work together as a group of people, we should be able to sit at the table and figure out how to best work for each other. Because at the end of the day, we all want the same thing, but we need to be more humble about our intentions within ourselves and for each other. I'll just briefly jump in and say, I think it's really, really tough work, um, you know, to, uh, I mean, you know, in some ways, what are we asking for is, first of all, making space for indigenous voices, just making space. Um, and I think just my thoughts on, um, you know, recent calls for anti-racism, which are braided together with with you know uh, anti-colonialism and 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 decolonizing are very helpful in getting uh, these settler colonial institutions and and these are institutions that that are built you know I, as I was talking about the the accession information or the way things are displayed the narratives uh, these structures are built to tell are so limited. And so the first step is sort of demanding, you know, and it has to come from a demand, not just from indigenous people, um, but from non-natives as well to make space and also to um, continue the work of repatriation, continue all the work under NAGPRA that, that isn't completed, you know, yet of course, um, but to even question, you know, uh, these collections and the practice of collecting and uh, you know, how do we preserve things? So there are so it, there's just a ton of work. And I think folks like Miranda are in the front lines of it. I'm coming from sort of an outside space out, at least outside of the museum, um, but I'm in an academic space and I know it's, it's very similar here. It's an institution that is grounded in um, settler colonial philosophies. And so how do we make space to have a different point of view come in and share that voice? It's a big question. And I think really quick, just to go back to that, Sam, is to say, um, I'm very lucky to have Eli and Alka here who have witnessed my journey on this uh, particular subject. And I think that as we have grown, um, we've also seen ways in which how we would how we would do things differently given what we know now. We are able to reflect and be very, how we should have had more team building within ourselves and our, and our groups and how would we want to see the outcomes given all this knowledge. And I hope that at one point we'll be able to have that discussion um, like something like this to be able to help other institutions learn from our successes, but also from our mistakes. So that way we can continue to do this work across the country. Yeah, I think what I came in, you know, I didn't look at the this project as being like a three-year project only. I looked at it as what we start now is long-term. So it's not just what do we need to get done in three years, but we're the, 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 these collections are still going to be at the museum. And a lot of the, you know, the relationships that the museum have with these communities has either some were good, some were bad, some were just, you know, dormant. So I think the importance is really listening to what the communities want. And they're also the better storytellers. I mean, they know their stories tell it better than anyone at the museum, but also at the museum, knowing what people go through there, what's, what are the issues and what are the things that get in the way and looking at where, say like, where are the good, the positive assets and how can these come together and how can, people, you know, thinking how to change, you know, who want to change things, but how to make that happen. And I think it helps on the museum and it's good because it gets people talking, but then also having the communities come in and telling their stories kind of reifies that for museum staff. And they understand that, you know, why communities feel a certain way. Uh, I mean, even the projects I'm working on, I'm doing a project with Chicago Gallery, there's a lot of Indians in Chicago that are positive about it. And then some feel like, well, at the end of the day, it's still putting Indians on display, mm -hmm. even with the community consent. So it's, you're going to have that, but I think it's good to listen 
and it helps you plan for these things. It helps you uh, think differently. I mean, I know with the Meskwaki is a good one, but also we have another project with the Blackfeet that, you know, what was nice to hear was our exhibitions department say, you know, well, let's take a break and let's develop a lot, a better relationship mm-hmm. and spend the time to build a relationship before we talk about an exhibit. And I thought that was really good. I mean, that was something in two years I've seen a change in, but I think that's more of that focus on just building relationships, listening and being able to talk like, like normal people not as academics, not as work or anything like that, but just as regular people. And I would just add that there was a, I was in a uh, sort of another webinar with um, our new president and with directors of other um, museums of natural history from around the country and even one from Germany and one of the directors, I think it was a Denver museum, said something. He said, you know, that this work of diversity and inclusion in their language, the language of institutions, has been going on and it's been good. But he really didn't feel like he was changing that much. So this is a president of this institution. And he wasn't really paying that much attention to it till the events of this summer and that when they murdered George Floyd and you know we all were in the streets that what he said is that blew the door off of the museum so you could not not pay attention at that point so what i want to say with that is this is the moment to try and get some change in those structures and people i think You know, there's this realization on the part of institutional powers that be that they do have to change. And so it's a good time for us to really think about how that can happen. So now there's another question. We'll keep going. We have still have a good amount of time here. Um, Here's a question again for all of you. Each of you emphasized approaching materials in archives, museums with love and care and as objects with life and and performative power. What practices have you used in that approach? So how have you actually uh, manifested this uh, love and um, care, I guess? Maybe Nina, if she's there, she can start off. We are all, I was also going to answer that. I, maybe we can, hi, we can answer together. <laughs> is, um, <laughs> the way I approach, I firmly am of the mind that that type of understanding and sacred understanding is already embedded in me from the prayers given to me from my family. So when I'm connecting to something um, important, whether it's And I firmly hold that true for any community item that I approach. So I might not, it might not even be sacred, but if I am in having the opportunity to be around in that space, I do so out of understanding that someone prayed or loved this item with intention and I need to approach it in the same ways in which that person did. And even if I don't understand that exact mechanism that it is something bigger than me and I need to understand that not everything is absolute, but not everything is, I'm doing the best I can by way of it. So for me, I just already know, I think it's embedded in me. But when I try to teach that to others, especially non-native people, I just always tell them to try to stay in line with, it's okay if you don't know this, it's okay if you make a mistake, what isn't okay is if you completely dismiss um, what I am trying to tell you, or if you completely just overlook it to the point where you're no longer trying to even understand me, you just want to be right. Um, And that's because our worldviews aren't always maybe um, understood or appreciated, but I think it goes back to because no one has ever been able to really teach people about who we really are until 
I mean, they have been learning, but not in the ways in which we, they should be. So I think for me, it's how can I help them at least understand who I am and my worldview. And then hopefully they can approach that item or those items in a way that better honors them later on. And then they can move forward in teaching that to others. Okay. Um, I have like a more, so when I go into a collection, I usually enter with my own language. Like I'll say, and that means I'm Nina, this is my crow name. I'm here to visit you. I respect you. Please see into my heart. And then when I go into my own people's collection, I say, you know, I'm back or I came to see you. I brought our people with us. Um, it's a beautiful day outside. We haven't forgot you. And I say these things in Crow. Um, I usually, I don't sing songs and that kind of thing because specific things have like specific songs and different clans and different bands have like different uh, ways they refer to different things. So I don't go too far into that unless there's other Psalagap people there that are doing that work. Um, actually picking things up. So, you know, I think most museums for at least of Saluga material, because there are some things you can't use gloves with, you have to use gloves with, but for the most part, I don't use gloves. I just make sure I really wash my hands before and after. And then, um, you know, I pick things up, I hold them and I speak to them and I say, Tajik, you're beautiful. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank you for making this. Um, and then like bells in our belief, like bells get rid of bad spirits or bad energy, or they sort of wake things up in a good way. So I ring the bells. Um, I take pictures of photographs and I post them on Facebook for my people to um, be inspired and create designs. I share images with them. Um, I, you know, I, I like actually pick up saddles or I laugh. I try to be joyful. Another thing is, is um, I do like a vibe check. If I'm not in a good place, I have to be real careful about going into those places. Mm -hmm. um, like I try to abstain, like not drinking alcohol or smoking or doing any of those things unless it's smoking for prayer. And then going into those spaces, just like I'm here for good. I want to do good things. Let me be open and be inspired, but protect me, right? Um, and so just engaging with it like it's a whole community. So if I were to go into another person's collection, um, I would be much more reserved. Um, I probably wouldn't talk too much. I definitely wouldn't touch anything unless I was with somebody who said, go ahead and touch that. Um, and then just trying to learn as much as you can. I think looking at collection records is important, but also asking collections people to include our narratives, like put that down, write that down, put it into your computer, put it into the archive, put it into the registration system. Because if somebody behind us, uh, after us comes along, this is, could be valuable information to them, right? My ancestors, Joe Medicine Crow did that, Barney Old Coyote did that, um, Mardell Plainfeather did that. So we have people that are even still alive who already did this work before us, even before, you know, there was NAGPRA. So yeah, activating objects um, at the Smithsonian, I have an incredible mentor named Josh Bell. He likes to call it making the object dance. And you can make objects dance in other ways, like they dance with you, you engage with them. And then they, sometimes they get into your dreams. I have many sisters and brothers who, are both native and non-native who worked in collections and who've had like incredible powerful experiences. You know, they have dreams about some of those people on those shields and things like that. Like that's incredibly important information. And I always just say, well, please write it down, like record it somewhere because we've moved so far away from the spiritual and the purpose of these things. And the reason they, as we believe, chose to be here in Chicago, in that museum at this very time and moment and place. We need those things. All of us needed to see those things. And there are shields out there in private collections, but we may never see them. But we see these, you can see them in photographs. And we have people that were still living and are still living who can say, yes, show them to people. They need to see them right now. It's healing, it's powerful. We need strength. We need to be able to draw from what they were created from. 
So um, yeah, that to me is activating the object. I know that you know other people have incredible ways too. Huh? Thank you. I don't know if Eli or Samantha, you also want to answer. Samantha, if you want to go. I just briefly say, I mean, I thought that, you know, Nina brilliantly sort of described practices, but also this is what many indigenous people um, believe about material life. Okay. And, and seeing objects as having a material life that's important to take care of in different ways. And it, and it of course, is their tribally specific ways. Um, but, you know, this is also that question I'd come back to about um, sort of our relationship broadly with collecting things. Um, I remember being, you know, in the, in the field collections and sort of all these beautifully made blue boxes labeled Dakota. And I wanted to see, open up every box and see um, all the Dakota objects in the holdings. But what, you know, uh, we, what lives are these objects living, I think is a good question to come back to. And it, it's broader. I mean, think about all the objects we can, we encounter in daily life, what we purchase as consumers. All of these objects have lives that go on, you know, perhaps after we're done with them and throw them in the trash. So I think just, uh, I'm just sort of broadening this idea of how do we have relationships with the non-human materials, materials that we humans make, but then also, um, of course, natural materials as well. So, uh, but I, I thought, you know, uh, the other answer is great as far as just talking about different practices that indigenous people bring to museums uh, of how to relate to these, these objects that are in the holdings. Eli. Yeah, I was going to say, I mean, when I, ca I came into museums originally working on human remains and in, in both museum and legal senses. So with that comes protocols and behaviors. And it's, it's, it's always in your mind that this is someone's family member and it's your job to be proper and to take care of them and to do what needs to be done. And I think with items and collections, it's the same thing. You know, somebody... I used to make jokes about museums and spoons and you go to a museum and all you see are spoons and baskets. And why is it just spoons and baskets? Um, but you know, you realize that somebody made that for someone, they were gifts, they were used. And I think in this process, it's funny, you know, working with Luke Capayu and John Green Deer who are spoon makers, it's like you realize what goes into a, something as simple and utilitarian as a spoon. And, um, but yeah, you just, you know that you're in a room filled with somebody else's belongings and it's your job to just make sure they're taken care of and also provide that access. You know, I know when Nina, you know, had all the crows at the museum, there were a lot of Cree and Chippewa folks too. So, you know, there was a chance for them to even visit materials in those uh, in the collections as well. And that's our job to make sure people can see and visit um like i said we're just the facilitators we open the door and we let people talk to their their relatives you know um and that those are those are all just wonderful comments and you know from what i've seen since we started this project since we brought in more native american staff um, but even before then, when we would have visitors and we had also, you know, Native staff have been there, um, just not as visible for many, many years, that has really influenced all of us who are non-Native and how we think about and work with the objects um, in the Native American collection. I can only speak to that. I don't know about the other collections, but I think there is a we have learned a lot from, from the way that um, our colleagues um, have approached 
the care and love with, with love and with humility. And, um, you know, and, and I'm grateful to, to my colleagues for teaching us this way of thinking. So just to say that, and then moving on, let's see. Um, we have a question for Miranda and Eli, um, and it revolves around indigenous collections from other parts of the world that have that are held in the Field Museum and the Newberry Library. How do you think community interventions involving Native American collections are also inspiring changes on how other indigenous items are interpreted, made accessible and used? That's a great question. Um, we just had this past week where um, our the curator or the person who oversees the um, uh, not the curator, I think he's just the collection manager, um, Ryan Phillips, is that, I think I'm saying it right. Um, and our developer, Ryan Schusler and Monisa Ahmed um, had gone to the Marshallese Islands um, last year. And there's now a, a space in the Pacific Hall that talks and says like, how have these kids who are also these Inuit kids who are in Oklahoma have a satellite community from the Marshall Islands in um, Oklahoma and how they came to the museum to interact with items that are from their communities um, as well as elders and were able to uh, um, decide which items could go out on display. Um, they found some people found photographs of their moms um, and of relatives in the archive um, and being able to go to the community to actually learn from them. So I know that this work has been happening and there's also relationships with the Maori community that is has, is an ongoing effort. Um, but again, I think it's hard for me to be able to speak to those specifics, not having been a part of those projects, but also not being able to, I'm not from those communities. So, but from what I've seen on the behalf of my colleagues, it's been an ongoing effort to do better by every community represented in the collection at the Field Museum. Eli, do you want to? Ditto on that. I think that's, uh, and hopefully, you know, we'll we'll see improvements too. It's like the Pacific collections in the Philippines. Uh, be nice to see some interventions with the African collections as well, and a curator. You know, <laughs> fingers crossed. Um, but it's you know we have a new president now who's it seems keen on that. At least he said that. So hopefully. We'll see some changes and, you know, hopefully this is just the beginning of longer term commitments. And I think as Samantha said, to broaden this a little bit, it, you know, this is happening in museums around the country and around the world. And um, I think it in large part or almost all due to the intervention by indigenous peoples and by people whose heritage are in these museums. I've been protesting in Brooklyn, New York, for example, there's a very active uh, movement called Decolonize This Place, um, where they have been demanding changes in museum practice. There's been sit-ins at the American Museum, and finally that awful statue in front of that museum is coming down. So I think you know, the interventions that are happening now from outside are having a deep impact. And those interventions have been going on actually for quite a while. So um, bearing fruit now, and I think that's really very healthy for museums. So I think this is our, our last question then for all of you is, um, what advice would you give to indigenous people who are going into the museum curatorial field? Who wants to start off on that advice? That's truly, um, <laughs> um, you know, I think it's, it's a lot of, so it's hard work in the sense of typically you have to to get to the curatorial position in institutions means having to get a PhD and, and a degree in that sort. Um, and I, in having a doctorate, 
um, I feel like it's my responsibility to try to help institutions move away from that so much um, and to make space for people who are more inclined with the communities to be able to have space at the table where they can actually have this experience. So I think it's about, for when I approached my own personal work was, where do I wanna, what am I doing this for? Why do I wanna go into a museum job in the first place? Because it's not easy. It's really emotional. It's also, it's beautiful, but you know, you have a lot of different moving parts and if it's not just because you want your name out there or your accolades, like if it's for your community and if it's for um, a bigger purpose, then use that as your motivation to continue doing this because more indigenous people in these spaces helping to implement the changes that we wanna see. And that means it's my responsibility to make space for those individuals um, and to continue to think about how I ground my own work. So I think staying strong, know who you are, be humble is my number one thing about everything. And knowing that you have people who are out there with you, with indigenous people who will help you and guide you and be kind to you is a huge thing. So not being afraid to reach out and figuring out who those people are. It has, you have to be a little fearless to do this type of work, but I think it's all worth it. Yeah, I would say also, I mean, don't go in thinking the system is functioning all the time because often you're walking into messes that have existed for previous years um, because museums change slowly. So, I mean, be patient. Uh, oh, was it Murphy's Law? Whatever, the worst that can happen probably will. Um, you know, just go in there knowing that you've got years of work to, you know, that you've got to sort of dismantle, but also change and, you know, don't expect everything instantly, but work hard. Um, keep true to why you're there, know why you're there, you know, and that's important and being there cause you want to be in there. You know, it's, I think it's more to say it's not a st you're not going to, it's not some magical stepping stone to greater things in the museum world. Uh, you know, and academia isn't always the, is the best thing, but if you're there because you know why you're there and you, you're helping communities and you see where changes need to be made and you're helping with that, that's going to be important. And also if you can get a job in a museum, that's an extra bonus because I could, from experience, you can go 10, 20 years waiting to get a job. So there's not, not a lot of work. So you also have to be patient on that. And then that's where the humility comes in is, you know, take advantage of other things that pop up because those will inform your museum work as well. Take it from a, an overnight baker, you know. Nina wanted to say something. Oh, unless you did, Sam, I don't want to you haven't been able to say too much. I'll just briefly add, and then and Nina could close us out, perhaps. Um, I, I would just, uh, you know, I'm not working in the museum curatorial field. I'm sort of, uh, you know, working and doing research with it, but I, I can speak to the academic route and just say to Indigenous folks, um, you know, who are, who are potentially majoring in these fields, um, you know, find institutions, find uh, universities and colleges that are supportive, have maybe robust uh, Native American and Indigenous studies programs, uh, be interdisciplinary, um, you know, read Native American literature, learn your languages. Um, all of that stuff will make you sort of prepare you. And I think it is a very tough field. I think you have to have tough, thick skin, um, and there are a bunch of challenges, but maybe it's good, good work, good trouble, as they say. And um, I, I just encourage folks who are passionate to, to go for it. There we go. So I, I came about curation in a very peculiar way. Um, and I think that 
it's probably more feasible route than getting a PhD. Um, but I wouldn't intend to curate for the rest of your life. I think that everybody at some point should have a space to tell a story with art and uh, objects. Uh, if you want to be a curator for the rest of your life, then yes, you should get a PhD. Absolutely. And you have to be prepared to write. So mm -hmm. write a lot all the time. Start writing now. You should have started writing like 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. You need to be a really good writer. There are not enough Indigenous writers in anywhere, really, at the end of the day. Um, and writing is so important because it creates a written collective narrative of different people, tribes, groups, nations. Um, that being said, um, get real used to like talking to people, calling people up, harassing artists, like just constantly harassing artists, like Instagram messaging them. Um, but when you can get the work together and tell an incredible story or help this artist speak, the language of academics and the world and uh, the collector and whoever these people are, then you've done your job. Um, I think you have to ask yourself, well, what is it that I have to say or bring to the table that makes my voice relevant? Because curators have an, a very, they have a, uh, an important role in educating the public about certain cultures, people, groups, ideas. Um, and so, you know, you need to be incredibly thoughtful about what you're saying and why. Um, you know, I, I always think if you're a curator, you should want to manifest change, mm -hmm. some sort of incredible change. And you have to have vision mm -hmm. because if you don't see out like this idea in front of you, you have to think about how do we get the money to bring them together? Do we need a blessing for it? How many letters do I have to write in order to get permission to show it? But you're showing contemporary art, you know, showing it, transporting it, all of the things that happen in the process of curating an exhibition is intensive. And so you have to learn about that either by volunteering, trying to take a job in a museum where they'll elevate your position. Um, and of course, getting an education. Fellowships are always important. The School for Advanced Research, the IERC and Ray internship is incredible for that kind of work. Uh, the Smithsonian has incredible fellowships, SEMA. Um, the list goes on and on. So, you know, finding ways to integrate yourself to really learn about museum work. And then imagine curating anywhere. Like you can find a wall where you have permission to put a bunch of wheat paste up and curate an exhibition right there. And then boom, it's on your CV. So, you know, really understanding how to navigate through all of these systems is part of that. And, you know, I think I divulged a lot of secrets right now. And I hope all of you run with it and do something amazing. So, oh ho. Well, thank you all. And just to add that there are many different ways to enter and be in part of the museum world. You can also be a collections manager, or collections work directly with the collections. There's exhibitions department. So there's many opportunities at all different levels. And there's so many great tribal museums as well that need people um, to work on their collection. So yes, please do become part of this world. We need you. With that, I wanna thank again, all of our panelists for a really amazing conversation and presentations and um, um, thank you all. And we'll now have about a 15 minute break um, till 11.45 when we'll have the next panel. Um, so with that, we will depart and make space for the next one. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everybody. Uh -huh. Thank you. Thank you.